What happens when someone dies from a gunshot wound? Do embalmers just cover it up with makeup and hope you won't notice? Or is there an entire science behind it? Spoiler alert, it's not cover girl. It's chemistry, sutures, wax, and a whole lot of skill. This work is called restorative art, and it's one of the most misunderstood parts of my job as a mortician. This is one of the most common questions I get, both online and in real life. Can you fix that? And I get why people ask. Trauma is shocking, and it's not like the peaceful deaths you see in movies. Or traumatic. I love the drama. But families often want one last open casket goodbye, and they deserve a real answer when they ask if that's even possible. The truth, sometimes yes, sometimes no, and sometimes it depends on how many hours of wax, sutures, and patience I've got left in me. Because restoration is equal parts science, art, and knowing when you've reached the limit of what's humanly possible. Lately, I've had a lot of questions about high profile cases in the news and in history. And even some from my own career, yes, I'm going to give you some personal stories, where people want to know, could this person have had an open casket? So let's break it down together. But before I walk you through specific examples, we need to cover the foundation. Otherwise, you'll think this is just makeup tricks, and it's not. Restorative art is an entire branch of mortuary science, and today I'm going to give you the classroom version, what it is, why we do it, and how it actually works. All right, class, you're my favorite favorite little students, did you know that? Let's start with the basics. What we're talking about today falls under something called restorative art. That's the part of mortuary science where we reconstruct, rebuild, and basically disguise trauma so a family can still have an open casket viewing if that's what they really want. Spoiler, restorative art is not about making someone look better. We're not contouring your cheekbones or giving you a glow up in the casket. It's about dignity, about allowing a family to see their loved one one last time without being traumatized by the injuries that caused their death. Why does this matter? Because in the U.S., open casket funerals are still very common. Families want to see their person. They want to touch their hand. They want to say goodbye to them, not to a closed box. And my job as a mortician is to make that possible when I can. So when you hear the question, can you fix that? What they're really asking is, can you give me closure? That's a heavy responsibility, and every embalmer takes it differently but I promise you, we all feel it. So what do we actually do? Here's the short version of the playbook. First, we clean and disinfect the wound. Then we suture the tissue, sometimes deep inside, sometimes right at the surface. If there's a hole or missing tissue, we use cotton or something called tissue builder, which is basically a filler we inject under the skin to plump things back up. Over that, we apply wax to smooth out the surface and sculpt missing features. Think your nose, cheekbones, and lips. Finally, we blend it with mortuary cosmetics. And yes, sometimes we use airbrushes for skin tone. It's sculpture painting and a little bit of engineering all rolled into one. But here's the kicker. There's only so much school can teach you. Mortuary science programs do have classes on restorative art. You'll read the books and you'll practice on those fake plastic E, plastic E, plastic ish heads. They literally give you mannequins to poke and wax up. Kind of fun. I enjoyed that class. But let me tell you, nothing prepares you for your first real case. In school, the wounds are neat little cuts or pre-molded holes. Real trauma, not so neat. Real trauma is messy, unpredictable, and different every single time. You don't really learn how to rebuild a shattered jaw in a car crash until you're standing in a prep room staring at it, and you can't go home until it's done, if it's even possible. Possible, or else you're going to be there really late, but I digress. Most of what makes you a real embalmer, the kind who knows when something is fixable and when it's not, it's learned on the job. Mortuary school gives you the basics, but it doesn't give you the judgment. And that judgment comes with experience. Sometimes you look at a wound and think, yeah, I can fix this. And other times you just know in your gut, I could spend 10 hours trying, but this will never look like her again. That call, when to try, 
when to say no is the hardest part of restorative art. And honestly, you'll never forget the first time you have to make it. So now that you understand the basic foundation, the science, the tools, and the limits, let's look at some real world examples, some from history, some from the news, and one or two from my own career that still keeps me up at night because trauma. <laughs> let's start with one of the hottest questions right now, Charlie Kirk. For those of you asking, yes, people want to know how his wound would be handled by an embalmer. The facts we do know so far, he was shot in the neck. The bullet didn't exit. So reports say the wound was about the size of a quarter, give or take. So how would I approach that as an embalmer? First, I disinfect and clean the wound. Then I would embalm, embalm like normal. If the bullet didn't exit, you've still got an open entry wound with blood and possibly tissue damage around it. Second, internal work. If there's a cavity, so if we have an open area, I'd suture the deep tissue layers to close off dead space, then pack it with cotton or filler to give it its shape or structure back so the skin doesn't collapse in on itself. Because you have to think that all of what made that area the area might be gone. Tissues, tendons, all the things. Which leads us into third, surface reconstruction. So tissue builder, liquid, we would inject it under the skin to restore that natural shape to the neck. Then mortuary wax would be smoothed over the surface to match the contour of the neck. And then fourth, cosmetics. Mortuary makeup to color blend and possibly an airbrush to make sure the tones looked natural and seamless. In an ideal situation, you wouldn't even see that wound anymore. Could that wound be closed enough for a viewing? Yes. In most cases, a single entry wound to the neck is very fixable. You might have to use a scarf, maybe a higher collar for a man, or strategic positioning, maybe with the casket pillow. I love a good casket pillow. Could always take a scissors to it, make a little bit of a bigger indent for the neck, and then pull the pillow around the neck to essentially hide the area. But this isn't the kind of injury that automatically rules out an open casket. The reality is a non-exit neck wound is one of the more manageable gunshot injuries for embalmers to work with. Head trauma, that's an entirely different story. So while Charlie Kirk's wife may have been advised not to view the body from a restorative standpoint, a wound like this could often be managed for presentation. Whether the family chooses to do that is another matter entirely. But I can tell from the videos and the pictures that have been put out by the family online that he was 110% embalmed. And I think that was for the best. She got to say goodbye. The whole family got to see him one more time. But here's the truth. Sometimes the wound is fixable, but the grief is not. And that choice belongs to the family, not the embalmer. If Charlie Kirk's situation shows us how a wound might be hidden with restorative art, Emmett Till's case shows us what happens when trauma is deliberately left visible. In 1955, Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy brutally murdered in Mississippi. His killers mutilated his body so badly that by the time he was recovered, he was unrecognizable. His face was disfigured, his body was bloated, and this was not a case where embalming could fix him into looking like the boy he was in life. His mother, Mammy Till, made a radical choice. She demanded an open casket. She said, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. That decision turned Emmett's funeral into a protest, a moment that ignited the civil rights movement. Instead of asking the embalmer to disguise the damage, she insisted the violence be shown as proof. That was restoration in a different sense, not of the body, but of truth. And I've seen echoes of that choice in my own work. Years ago, I had a teenager who made the ultimate decision. If you get where I'm going with that, the ultimate final decision somebody can make. The parents made it very clear they did not want me to cover the wound. They wanted the classmates who came to the service to see the reality, not to punish them, but to warn them. If you do this, there are consequences, and this is that consequence. They wanted the whole class to see and feel their grief, and to hopefully convince them that if there was another Another student that was thinking of doing this that they wouldn't. That service has stayed with me because it reminded me that families grieve in different ways. Sometimes they want restoration and sometimes they just want truth. 
My job is to honor whichever path they choose, even when it's hard for me to stand behind the casket knowing the wound is visible. Sometimes our job is to hide trauma, sometimes our job is to show it, and both choices can be about dignity. Now, not every case becomes a movement or a lesson, some become myths. And when it comes to myths and mysteries around embalming, nobody sparks more rumors than Tupac. Yep, we're talking about Tupac, because if Emmett Till's funeral became a protest, Tupac's became a myth. The rapper was shot multiple times in Las Vegas in 1996 and died six days later in the hospital. And ever since, I don't think we'll ever stop hearing about it because rumors about what happened to his body have spread faster than his music. One of the biggest myths is that Tupac's embalming was botched, that the funeral home did such a poor job that his body looked terrible. Others say he was cremated within hours of his death to cover it up, fueling all of these conspiracy theories that he never really died. Here's the truth. Most of those claims are impossible to verify. What we do know is that multiple gunshot wounds, especially to the torso and the chest, are extremely difficult cases. The body undergoes major trauma, organs are destroyed, and internal embalming circulation can be compromised. I mean, you're also going to get that when there's an autopsy. We just work through it. It'll take you a few hours longer, but it is what it is. So as an embalmer, here's the problem I see right away. Even if you restore the surface, internal damage can make it almost impossible to preserve someone well enough for a longer drawn out viewing. That's why quick cremation isn't always a cover up. Sometimes it's the only option when you are working with extensive trauma and if decomposition just takes over. Because once it starts, we can't can't always stop it. So was Tupac cremated fast because of a conspiracy? No, it's way more likely he was cremated fast because multiple gunshot wounds make a body incredibly difficult to restore. Tupac's story shows how public figures can spark conspiracy theories around embalming. I feel like Charlie Kirk's case really recently speaks truth to this. But not every case is shrouded in mystery. Some are surprisingly straightforward, even when the whole world is watching. Just look at Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who unalived JFK. After JFK was assassinated in Dallas in 1963, his killer, Lee Harvey Oswald, was himself shot on live television by Jack Ruby. And here's where things get interesting from an embalmer's perspective. Oswald died of a stomach wound. Messy. Yes, absolutely messy. But not catastrophic to the face or the head. That meant his body was still repairable for an open and casket. And here's a wild detail. His funeral was so sparsely attended that reporters had to step in as pallbearers just to lower the casket. From a technical standpoint, this was actually a much more straightforward case than JFK's. JFK's head wound made an open casket impossible. Which, by the way, if you're morbid like me and you want to look up JFK's autopsy photos, they're public. You can look that up. But don't do that unless you want to or you're like me. And now you're gonna have to, but come back. Go look and then come back, I'll wait. Okay, moving on. So JFK's head wound made an open casket impossible. If you just went and looked at the photo, you understand why. But Oswald's stomach wound, with embalming, sutures, cavity work, and cosmetics, you could easily present him in an open casket for viewing, which is exactly what was done. Here's the irony. The man who made JFK's open casket impossible had one himself because his own wound was much easier for embalmers to fix. But not every case is so straightforward. Sometimes you face trauma that no amount of wax, sutures, or skill can put back together. And the first time I had to tell a family no, that there was nothing left to see, it was a young woman in a car accident, and that case still haunts me to this day. Every embalmer has a case they'll never forget. For me, it was a young woman, a teenager, who was hit by a car, hit and run. And I'll be honest, her face still haunts my dreams. She had no teeth. 
teeth left. Her face was completely caved in. Her cheekbones and nose were shattered. There was no shape left to her face. There wasn't much of it left. I remember standing there in the prep room with my preceptor staring, thinking, could I rebuild this? Could I fix her? Mortuary school taught me that I could fix this. Maybe if I spent hours reconstructing cheekbones, sculpting a new nose, rebuilding from the inside out with wax and cotton, but would it have looked like her? Probably not. It would have looked like a wax mask, not the girl her parents remembered. And that's where the skill of an embalmer isn't just about what your hands can do. It's about judgment, knowing when to say, I can't give you an open casket and telling a family, looking them in the eyes and saying, I'm sorry, it isn't possible. She wouldn't want you to see her this way. That is something you never forget. That was the first time I had to do it and it has stayed with me ever since. In this case, the family still wanted a open casket because of their religious beliefs. So what we did is we wrapped her head, shoulders up. We wrapped her carefully in cotton. We covered the top half of her body with a blanket and we left her hands visible. Her hands were still intact. They were in really good shape. And that gave her family and her friends something to touch, to hold, to love on and to remember her. It wasn't the goodbye that they hoped for, but it was the goodbye that they were able to get. You never forget the first time you have to tell a family no, because that's when you realize we can create miracles in this work, but we're not miracle workers as much as I wish we could be, because I would have given anything to be able to put her back together for them. Oh, that was deep. Okay. So let's bring it all together. We started with Charlie Kirk, a case where a wound to the neck might actually be manageable for an embalmer. Then Emmett Till and my own case with a teenager. Times when the trauma was left visible to tell a bigger truth. Then Tupac, where myths and conspiracies clouded what embalming could realistically achieve. And finally, Lee Harvey Oswald, where an open casket was possible because the injury was technically easier to repair. Sometimes you just get lucky. And then there are cases like the young woman in that car accident I told you about, where no matter how much skill, patience, or wax I had, there was nothing left to rebuild. That's the heart of restorative art. Sometimes we can restore someone, sometimes we can't. Sometimes our job is to hide trauma, sometimes our job is to show it. But in every case, the goal is the same. Dignity for the dead, closure for the living. So no, embalmers don't just slap on makeup. We suture, we sculpt, and we re build. We carry the weight of saying yes when we can make things happen and no when we can't. And every case tells a story, whether it's in history books, in pop culture, or in the memory of one grieving family. I'm Lauren the Mortician. Thank you for watching and learning with me and listening to everything I have to say. I just want you to know that it means the world to me when you like, subscribe, comment, maybe tell me how your day is going. I love our little community we have going here and it just gives me such purpose to show up for you every week here on this platform. And if you want more answers to the questions most people are too afraid to ask, you know who to ask, me. I'm your girl, your favorite mortician, Lauren the Mortician. I'm happy to be here. I love you. Let me get you a mango kiss. Don't go nowhere. Oh, Mango left me. You get a Lola kiss. Come here. <laughs> She's getting so big. Her name was Lola. She was a show Boston. Can you kiss it?